all for the invitation to come here uh, to take part in this workshop today and to congratulate you on the work that you have already done. Uh, your themes are important, your document is purposeful, and you've accomplished a great deal already in your work together over the past year. So based on my experience, I'd say you've been doing everything correctly up until now. It helps to get buy-in from all participants at the beginning. That can be accomplished by taking it slowly, starting with regular seminars on work in progress to get to know one another, building up a shared vocabulary, an understanding of methodologies, a shared repertoire of key debates, and an elaboration of the concepts used to frame those debates and to negotiate them. And finally, to build a shared sense of the overarching goals of what you want to do. I think one of the challenges in this kind of teamwork is balancing individual goals with communal project goals. Uh, this work goes best when you could figure out how to get these two sets of goals aligned rather than working together at cross purposes. So I would underline uh, what Jan said about the importance of um, completing those yellow stickies, but also really thinking seriously about what you want to get out of this collaborative work as, um, as, a, as a larger communal project, but also individually. So my experience with collaborative cross-disciplinary team research derives from several projects with overlapping goals in the general area of globalization and culture. I've been a team member, a deputy director, a principal investigator on a range of interdisciplinary and international team projects, and I've been involved on a number of adjudication committees for our national funding agency, um, awarding funds for partnership grants of various kinds. So I'm going to briefly describe some of this work with the aim of addressing the mandate for today, what works and what doesn't work. And I think the answer obviously varies according to the nature of the team and its goals, but there may be some general advice that helps in relation to planning, management, outreach, and documentation of impact once the specifics are accounted for. So the balance of components will differ depending on the size of the group, its heterogeneity, its partnerships, and the nature of the goals. And these could be academic, policy-oriented, agenda-setting, problem-solving, partnership development, or research creation. There's a whole range of possibilities for you to consider. So from 2001 to the present, uh, I've worked as deputy director of a major collaborative research initiative on globalization and autonomy. This was an ambitious five-year project with a core budget of roughly $2.5 million, involving approximately 40 co-investigators from about 14 different disciplines, 10 international collaborators, many postdoctoral fellows and graduate students, an associated sub-team uh, working on the two Mediterraneans and run out of Tunisia, and an online compendium run in partnership with associated funding in the digital humanities. So our core funding has just run out. We've published eight refereed volumes in a globalization and autonomy series with the University of British Columbia Press. One of those volumes is on the issue of legitimacy, so if you haven't come across it, you might want to take a look at it. Um, we've published one in French with Laval University Press, and all the volumes are being translated into Chinese with at least the first four, maybe the first six, out already. We're currently, uh, three of us are currently co-writing a kind of capstone volume looking back on what we accomplished called Globalization and Autonomy Conversing Across Disciplines. So this project sought to advance understanding of the opportunities globalization creates 
and the constraints it places on individuals, communities, and nation states as they seek to secure and build autonomy, which we defined initially as, as, as the right or capacity to govern oneself. As an outgrowth of that project, I also participated in a smaller two-year project called Building South-North Dialogue on Globalization Research, with seed funding from 2007 to 2008. Um, that project brought research on globalization from the Global South into more sustained dialogue with research from Canada and the Global North through two funded workshops, and it led to an unsuccessful grant application for further work. So why was one successful and the other not? I think the answers are complex. Um, I could go into them in more detail later, but first of all, I'd say that globalization and autonomy was also not successful in its first year of application. That first year, we applied under the title Globalization, Autonomy, and the Human Condition. It now seems astonishing to me that we could have gone forward with such a broad title, but we took it from the title of the Principal Investigator's uh, Research and Teaching Center at his university, and we didn't think sufficiently to differentiate the mandate of the center from, at a single university from the goals of a multi-university research project. Once we narrowed our focus, we found ourselves with a tighter, more manageable project. So even that first year, we did make it to the shortlist, which included an hour's interview with an eight-person multidisciplinary committee. And their questions helped us to refine our thinking about what interdisciplinarity involved, why it mattered, and how it might be achieved. And we had not really given these questions sufficient attention in our initial preparations. We, we thought we had, but we hadn't. We'd focus most of our attention on our subject matter, primarily globalization. And we hadn't thought enough about the methodological challenges that come with any type of multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, or transdisciplinary work nor which kind of experimentation with methodology might work best for our project. And following on from the methodological question, we hadn't thought enough about the audiences our books um, would address, or even the adjudication committees they would have to pass through when they were designed to be fully interdisciplinary. So from this first failure, we learned a number of valuable lessons. First of all, don't give up. Our principal investigator had never experienced failure before, and he was tempted to give up. But the rest of us on the management team saw ways we could retool the application and rethink our project. Because we were not the leader, the defeat was less personal for us. And here I think team support was crucial. The principal investigator had to pull it all together and he had to bear the brunt of the responsibility. But there has to be a team with him or her to pull their weight. It has to be a team effort from the beginning and all the way through, and it is a really big commitment for everyone. So you have to be clear about what you can contribute and how it will work for you. Uh, there were initially four of us writing the capstone volume, one of us dropped out because his priorities had changed and he wasn't ready for the major commitment it was. So the senior members of our management team knew that we wanted the challenge and that we could afford the risks of this kind of work. And I think it's important not to underestimate the risks of undertaking interdisciplinary team research at this point in history. For the more junior members and for the students especially, it was a riskier venture, given that silos still operate at many levels of assessment, and it's still necessary to prove yourself in disciplinary terms and through single-authored ventures, even if co-authorship and partnership work are also beginning to gain some credibility in some circles. So in Canada, grant adjudication criteria are changing, although basically I'd say that now you need to do it all. You have to have co-authored work, 
but you still have to have single authored work. You have to have worked in teams, but you still also have to have done work on your own and your own discipline. Um, in other areas of adjudication, such as hiring, tenure and promotion, and publication criteria, assessment, in my experience, is not changing so quickly. So you do have to account for that. Our team was committed to building a transgenerational network, and we recognized the need to provide extra support and different kinds of training for the junior members of our team to help them negotiate this transitional moment in globalizing forms of knowledge production and assessment. As the job market changes and university structures shift, the question of what kinds of training are needed requires a lot more thought. The changing conditions of knowledge production and dissemination are a factor that no current team project can ignore. And for this reason, I've recently joined a project just funded from Finland called Ethical Internationalism in Higher Education in Times of Global Crises. This is a post-colonial and decolonial project working to legitimate and integrate pluriversal modes of understanding into citizenship education and to balance an increasing focus on technical training with cultural and cross-cultural modes of performance. We've also been selected as a formal network within the World Education Research Association, an association of national uh, research associations across the globe. So while most members of this team work in faculties of education from around the world, some of us are in English, gender studies, native studies, and applied linguistics. So the point I'm trying to make here is that it's important to be clear about the degree of interdisciplinarity that's appropriate for your personnel and for your project, and to consult the research on how to make interdisciplinary work. There is a lot of uh, research out there now. Think carefully about the disciplinary expertise you will need on your team to reach your goals. Have group discussion about these questions and perhaps run some trial interviews before applying for external grants, even if the grants you're going for do not include this component. How will people from other disciplines and other places view your work? Anticipate their critiques and adjust for their advice. Think especially about what implications your choices will have for methodology as you do the research and writing. And uh, also for communicating within a range of publication venues as you move toward publication. Recognize that different disciplines respond differently to interdisciplinary challenges and decide how much effort you need to make to include a range of perspectives. We were pushed to include economics in globalization autonomy. And we just couldn't find anyone in straight economics, in an economics department, willing to work with us. One of the more useful practices we developed was to share individually produced work in progress through a process that involved circulating the draft to the appropriate subgroup in advance and assigning two people from disciplines different to the author to present the draft to the group, commenting on how they saw its argument, its method, its relation to our project, and its contribution to uh, meeting the project goals. We did this with every chapter in our community's volume, sometimes two or three times for three years running. And it really helped us to see where we needed to work harder to define our terms, to refine our theoretical frameworks, and to communicate our meanings to audiences beyond those we normally addressed within our specialized epistemic communities of readers. Each volume made different methodological and rhetorical choices in communicating its results in the end, so that some volumes remained deliberately diverse and others created a more integrated impression. Some ended with conclusions or epilogues and some had no formal concluding chapter. So in retrospect, we realized that in designing our project, we paid a lot of attention to globalization research and very little to autonomy. I regret we did not have a philosopher on the team um, to help us with contemporary autonomy debates. 
We read some feminist philosophy on relational autonomy as we prepared for our first full team meeting, but we didn't really understand that we were all using the term differently until about the third year of our meetings together. <laughs> it took us a long time. I am now reading a book called Asia as Method that points out the many conceptual slippages in translations of key political terms from English into Japanese, Chinese, and Taiwanese scholarship. And the major analytical differences these translations introduce to how contemporary democratizing and modernizing challenges are understood in these contexts. The author, Quan Sing Chen, argues that moving the point of reference from the UK and the US changes the understanding of analytical terms such as civil society, state, informal economy, and public sphere. So how to build such genuine sites of difference into research projects such as yours, while also ensuring your work makes sense to adjudicators who may be less attuned to the shifting conditions of knowledge production globally, it's going to be a major challenge um, moving forward. Uh, I think that uh, Jan Art Schultz Building Global Democracy Project began to attack that problem on an ambitious global scale, setting up a series of dialogues that are simultaneously trans-regional, trans-linguistic, trans-disciplinary, and trans-sectoral. And we had some challenging discussions about perceptions of democracy and other key terms in those workshops. So I could talk more about this question later, but I do think you need to think about the decolonial, de-imperializing, and what Chen calls de-cold war context for thinking about the ways in which um, universities do participate in um, current regulatory systems and the ways in which they need to change if they are to become truly global. Um, so what we found in globalization and autonomy, uh, reinforced in building global democracy, was that sometimes each discipline can use a specific term in a distinctive way without realizing that other disciplines understand the term differently. And when you're working transnationally, these misunderstandings can be compounded by different histories and political experiences, making it even more critical to sort them out. The South-North Dialogue Project never fully came to terms with these challenges, in part because we lacked the time to develop an understanding of how important they were, but also because the team was never able to draw convincing connections between the disparate interests of its members. So I learned from that experience in designing my own recently funded project, Brazil-Canada Knowledge Exchange, Developing Transnational Literacies. In this project, we focus directly on how to understand situated forms of meaning making and the alternative understandings they generate. It's a partnership development project linking a few university-based research projects, professors, teachers, and teachers in training in different parts of Brazil and Canada with the aim of helping teachers of English develop strategies for promoting critical transregional and transnational literacies in their classrooms and their research production. It's designed for Brazilians and Canadians to learn from each other and with each other as well as about each other. Um, for reasons of time, I won't list our goals here. I'll just say that we're still figuring out how to advance them together. We're generating some wonderful workshops for teachers and students, and some exciting interactions when we meet in person. <coughs> but it remains difficult to generate the intensive interdisciplinary dialogues that we need and to facilitate regular exchanges on an ongoing basis, sharing work in progress and co-producing work together. Despite the virtual connections now enabled by new technologies, face-to-face -face interactions in a dedicated time period still work best for multi-sided teams. There are also many cultural differences to negotiate and deeply ingrained assumptions to challenge in both countries. These challenges are what make the work valuable and it's always fun. What, when you are dealing with issues that matter to people 
the interactions become incredibly rewarding. Um, so I'm a huge advocate of this kind of work. Uh, as a literary scholar with a background in post-colonial cultural studies, I'm interested in the frameworks that a group sets itself, the vocabulary it employs, and the assumptions embedded in these. As some of you note in your document, naming is not neutral. I could talk at more length about the insights generated from colleagues in other parts of the world about the ideological implications that they saw in terms that to me seemed initially neutral or even positive. Terms like mentor or um, emancipation. So once you've framed your own group synergies, it'll be time for you to consider interacting with colleagues on a global scale. At that point, you may find, as we did with globalization and autonomy, that your initial framings need to be rethought or your questions rephrased to address a range of new perspectives. We had what our principal investigator thought was a small team rebellion at our first full team meeting as the group took full ownership of the project by revising its methodology and refining its goals, including reworking all its key questions. And it was the flexibility and openness to criticism of our principal investigator and our management team that enabled us to strengthen the project and strengthen the group spirit through this experience that could have been a failure. I think our principal investigator still sees it as a failure. He's still asking himself, how could I have anticipated this? <laughs> what could I have done differently? But it seems to me that this is the kind of surprise that teamwork often throws up for us if it's going well. Um, so be prepared <laughs> for flexibility, for flex, for friction, for challenges. I think that your document testifies to the strength of your analysis and to the depth of your commitment. And I look forward to discussing these questions with the rest of you and discussing the document itself through the rest of the day.